the mon just news from the monastery is good. We, as you might know, I usually go to uh, Asia in the uh, before Christmas, before the New Year. So I was in uh, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. I think I taught three retreats or something, um, and met Ajahn Sumedho and so on. And came back for the winter retreat starting January. And then January, February, March, we had a winter retreat, which is a kind of a voluntary lockdown. And well, someone's waving there. Can you hear me? Yeah, everything's yeah, okay? Yeah. Um, so we had a kind of voluntary lockdown, and, uh, which was quite nice. It's called a retreat. And then, of course, the COVID thing came in and we just kind of carried on. And so I realized I've, I came into Buddhism uh, as soon as I found out about the Dharma. I think within a year and a half, I was in the robe. So all my experience of Buddhism has been in community, not, not virtual community and, and actually residential community, monasteries with monks and nuns and, and lay people living together. So I've never had the sense of lack of community. Sometimes I've been fed up with community, that's for sure, and wanted to get away from community. But the sense of lack that I understand lots of people will feel when they're, you're on your own maybe, and, and not many people are really interested in reflection or in, in Buddhist ideas or whatever. Um, that, that must be very, very difficult. It could be very, uh, a very kind of lonely space. And that's one of the... <clears throat> things I do find that lay practitioners, um, they lose a lot of friends <laughs> when they come to the Dhamma, not because of aversion, but just because of a change of interest, uh, where some people are more interested in to whatever it might be, and other people are inclining towards a more reflective and quiet life and not interested in, in getting so distracted. And that, that movement in different directions um, can be very difficult if it's in marriage, uh, very, very difficult because the value system becomes, um, even though people might be kind of like friends, they're not really kalyanamitta in the sense of dharma friends, sharing dharma, not necessarily. So these, um, I think, very grateful TBC organizing this, Lynn and Patrick and uh, Tim and Jeff and, every, and Eleanor and so on. Thank you for doing this because it's, it's a very compassionate thing to do and uh, it's actually very interesting isn't it it's very different um, so my reflections this morning I hope I think most of you were there were around a simple idea and and the same old idea actually around what mindfulness is awareness and just trying to present it in um, in a maybe a novel fashion, maybe not. But so the idea I was using was, you know that you know. And that, that moment when you're meditating and mind has been planning something, all of a sudden your knee hurts and you know you're here. You know your knee hurts, you know you've been thinking, you know that you know. And that to me is so very, very significant because that is the moment of awakening that I would, early on, I would try to get that, you know, so I see myself thinking, and then I try to get rid of thinking to come back to awareness, but that was not aware of the very desire to get rid of thinking. And, and just taking that stance of I know that I know, and then abiding and trusting in that is, is for me terribly important. And that really raises the issue of trust and faith. What do you trust in? What do you have faith in? I trust in morality, I trust in the monks here, uh, I trust in my doctor, um, and so on and so forth. I trust the, uh, that the car's working and all these worldly trusts, but you know, in, in my own heart, in terms of my experiences as a human being and, and, and the results of my practice, what is the most trustworthy? And that, to me, is this awakened mind. Now, that awakened mind is not, this, it's not like early on, I think, probably all you've had the same experience early on it's a kind of attempt to control to try to control my emotions and not be angry and and try to generate more compassion which is good you know which is not a bad thing but there was always this sense of uh, 
of um, that I'm the author of all this. You know, that it's my fault that I'm angry. And then if I really got my act together, I could be more compassionate and so on and so forth. And, and that really wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. You know, I was just functioning from idealism and in a good place. And uh, the intellectual information I was getting, but it was very much not mindful, but idealistic. And there was a sense of becoming. And that obviously won't work. It works to a certain extent. It made me a better social being. Right, so I, I tended to uh, be much more careful with speech, and and um, you know, obviously I wasn't like indulging in sensuality. So those are good things. Uh, but then that kind of deeper sense of longing I had for peace um, wasn't really being fulfilled in that way. I was becoming a better person socially, but that that sort of deep fulfillment and longing I think we all have for the deep silence of the heart, which sometimes we experience. Uh, as children or at a retreat where the mind just stops. The mind just stops. And there's silence and there's beauty and there's awe. I think we've all had that. I, I suspect we have. I had that as a child. Um, I, you know, so so I, it's always been something that has been subconsciously a part of my search and my inquiry. And and so the the, the parts of Buddhism that I really like to talk about it are, are those parts, that, that transcendent part. Now, Buddhist psychology is great, um, and Buddhist ethics is, is really important. And I guess I talk about this more and more, more because I do live in a good community where ethics are already, already in place and social responsibility is in place. And I, I live in an environment where I really care for the environment. Like this year, uh, the trees are doing fabulously. We've planted a lot of uh, fruit trees and ornamental trees to try to draw birds and insects and so on. In the last two years, we've had the uh, carpet, uh, car I don't know what they call tent caterpillars, two huge infestations of tent caterpillars, and the poor trees are just doing so poorly. And now this year, they're just so vibrant and so beautiful. So all of that, like environmental considerations and social considerations, uh, they're all in place for me. And I realize in lay life, they're not maybe so in place and one is engaged in, in, in um, social dynamics which are maybe more complicated in my life because this, this, this is in place. But, but also I think it's important that we do spend some amount of our time in what we're considering in spiritual life for, for the ideas of Nibbana or the transcendent which the Buddha uh, presented to us because that was his enlightenment. It was around that that he, um, where his realization was. And so the ethical considerations and the social dynamics and the sense of restraint that we have and the caring for each other, those are all a foundation for that realization. They help and they make life beautiful. So, so say one of the things that we um, are encouraged to do is, is to contemplate the beautiful, not try to own it, uh, not try to keep it, but just to contemplate beauty and allow the beauty to make your mind happy. Now, that's, that's not desire. That's not desire. It's the seeing of. Uh, and this is very, very true in nature, isn't it? Like right now at my bird feeder on the ground, below the bird feeder, um, there are three types of rodents. Um, shouldn't call them rodents, should I? But... There's the gray squirrel, the, the red squirrel, and the chipmunk. And then there's competing families. And now the young ones have come. So now you've got the really silky furred ones, and you have the really old furred ones, and then you have uh, the competition and all that. And it's rather wonderful to watch. It's rather wonderful to watch and, and, and interesting and, and, uh, and beautiful. Now that watching of mine uh, isn't isn't uh, based on desire, it's based on attentiveness and being present to the way things are. Now that's different than me trying to excite the mind. And if I'm trying to excite the mind with, you know, fabulous movie on Netflix or something else, that's very, that's very fascinating drawing, but what that gives you quite often is an echo of the plot line, of the music, of the narrative, and that plot line runs 
to your head, doesn't it? And it, and it goes on and on and on. And, and to me, that's okay. But mudita, or the sense of uh, empathy for beauty, the joy that comes from empathy of beauty. That's why I like to read Mary Oliver, the, the uh, American poet, where she really touches that through her mindfulness, through her clarity, through her presence, because she really sees a butterfly. Or she, she, she really like lives in the middle of a tree and, and, and not really knows the tree from her heart uh, outward. So, so we have that capacity. We have that capacity for, for, for joy and beauty. Um, and, and that's a way to uplift the mind, right? That's not excitement. But also, also we have the capacity for compassion. We have the capacity to see people um, in dire straits or in suffering or um, in difficulty or ourselves. And we have the capacity then to appreciate that. That's compassion. Uh, we have the capacity to not react. That's difficult, isn't it? We can see um, maybe someone says something to, maybe like, let's say, you're, you're in a discussion with five people, 10 people, that's only five is allowed now, right? Five, five people. <laughs> and uh, one person has a political view different than yours. Now, you can call it and say, well, I disagree with you. Okay, fine. Discussion is on. But you can also notice the reaction to disagree, right? And you can, if you get very good at it, you can choose to say something or not say something. And that's the capacity we have too, capacity to reflect on the tendency to react, but not react. The tendency to react, pause, and then to respond. And that's a really beautiful skill, isn't it? We have the, we have the capacity to um, reflect on the commonality of the human condition, that you and I both want to be free, we want to be happy, we don't like suffering, we don't like pain, uh, and that when I, when I am hurt by someone's words, I can say, well, that's what everyone feels like when they're hurt by someone's words. And then I can reflect on that. I said, I'm not going to do that to anyone else. I'm going to try not to hurt anyone with anyone with my, my wrong speech or my hurtful actions or whatever. And that's a tendency of, of, of unifying metta. Metta is a kind of unifying quality where uh, we put away the differences, male, female, race, age, gender, all that. But you and I are human beings, or mammals even, you know, mammals that run around under my, uh, my bird feeder. So these, these capacities we have for the heart responding with joy, with compassion, with, 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 uh, with calmness, with unanimity, and so on, these, these capacities, are, I would say, are the fruition of this understanding of the unconditioned. So when you talk about the unconditioned or transcendent or Nibbana, it sounds, um, well, it is very abstract. I mean, how can you even imagine the unconditioned? It's unimaginable, that's the whole point of it. Or Nibbana, right? It's like a place or something like heaven. Um, so the, this, this, the language that we have around it, the island, say, that's more concrete, peace, freedom of suffering, freedom from craving, that language is more approachable. But when, when the heart, when the mind has this capacity, and it always has it, but when it abides in this know that you know, then the tendency to, to react is seen as something which is suffering, which is not appropriate, which does not lead to a good result. But the tendency to respond from a, a good place, a pure place, a clear place, brings a really, really good result, brings a happy result, brings a peaceful result, and has no traces. This is one of the things I think I came across. It must have been a Zen reading I had many, many, many years ago, and that idea of no traces, no traces left in the mind. And how often have I, you know, spoken to someone out of ill will or, or just kind of a cynical put down and said something and then walk away and have to live with that for the next 12 hours. This kind of, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that, right? And we all do that. And, and then you learn, you learn, oh, 
This is a feeling of wanting to say something clever and cynical, but you don't go there. Now that's the kind of freedom, isn't it? That's the kind of freedom of choosing uh, habitual reactivity and pausing and then responding. And the training is in that kind of a progression. So in the beginning, um, your mouth off to anyone, <laughs> regret all the time. Um, and then you begin to take responsibility. And that responsibility um, is, is different than idealism. I keep stressing this, don't I? The, the idealism is I'm always going to say the right thing all the time, always say compassionate things and be happy. <laughs> but it, life doesn't work that way because the, the arising of cynical comments or hurtful comments or fearful comments or obsequious comments or, or domineering comments, whatever you want, they come from habit. It's not like you're doing it deliberately. That's just, that's just the force of a, a structure in mind that when it's triggered comes into consciousness. In some sense, you have no choice of the arising, but you do have a choice of the tendency to react through that, don't you? That's, that's the choice we have. That's the choice we have. And as it arises, as we, if we can say, rather than idealism, I shouldn't think like this and try to repress it, if we have the faith and courage to say, oh, uh, this, is, this is a feeling of wanting to say something and just stay with that, then over time, we don't say it and the tendency to say it lessens and remor remorse and regret isn't there and there are no choices. So the reaction, the habitual uh, tendency to react or the, the, the karmic momentum, it maybe is still there, but now you're, you're knowing, oh, this is, this is that feeling. You're staying with it, staying with it. And then you blow it and you say something, all right? I'll do that again. I'll try that again. You just keep doing it until the power of karma is is not so powerful. What's powerful is mindfulness or awareness. Now awareness, is, like I've been saying, I can, let's say you're, you're in this discussion with five people and, and you're on the political say left and the person speaking is on the political right and says things which you start to react to, right? You start to react to. Now mindfulness or awareness or knowing um, it, it's different than just saying yourself, oh, I, I, I'm going to react. I, I should be careful. I'm going to react to this. That's self-view. That's not dharma. That's the what we call self-view. I'm someone who's having this reaction. I better be careful. I better not say anything, which is good. Which is good. But deeper than that, to know it with awareness, with full awareness, you know it as an object which has arisen, which will persist, and which will change. You know it as dharma. And that's different. That's very, very different. And that's what we want to get to in this practice. Again and again and again, we want to get to that place which knows things just as they are, objectively. And what's the problem? Is the subjective storyline um, proliferation on these things. So doubt, say. You start to doubt something. Fine, I'm doubting. And I try to figure it out. But then the doubt takes over. Maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should. Why didn't I do that? And it can run for a day. And through that whole day, there's been thinking, and you kind of know you're doubting, but there's never been the arising, oh, doubt is like this. Doubt feels like this. I know that I know. I know that I know. Now, that's the returning which we, we are trying to do. Now, as I was saying in the, um, in the meditation earlier, uh, in the morning, having, trusting in that, um, you, you will find that more and more you're not threatened by these things. You're not threatened by jealousy or resentment or, or fear or all these different things that come up. They're no longer a threat because you know that that's not really who you are. That's not your real home. And that you can't witness it without it being a problem. And as you get to that point of this is not a problem, you know, it is as it is. It's not a problem. It's not my problem. Then you say, Bring it on. Fine. Come on, Mara, let's have it. Because you're no longer afraid of it. Because you no longer identify with it. And say, all right, Mara, you want to do your best. See if you can fool me. Right? And, and you kind of, you have this kind of courage and, and confidence that whatever. 
I know that I know. Then you, because you have this deep faith in, in awareness and knowing. And then I think what happens is, is that because it begins to, it can even manifest more actually, but because you, 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 the, the clarity now is in the knowing, these things begin to fall away. And the mind has more and more brightness because it's not clouded by these things. It's not interfered by these things or, or obsessed by these things or taken up by these things. They are just things more and more. So then, you know, as, as you, as you um, abide in this sense of knowing that you know, your, your, your attention is less and less in thought because you see that thought is simply the constant proliferation of these habits. So it might be habits of resentment, or habits of self-doubt, or self-disparagement, and you begin to witness, know that you know, even thought, that thought is an object. And you can see how subjective thought is. It's about me, it's about you, and it's about what it should have been, you should have been, it's about the past, it's about the future, it's the whole creation of the world. And there's that insight that that's just a thought that this resentment is just a thought and a memory which has come up. And more and more the, the reference is no longer through thinking, but it starts to go into the body, into the heart. The abiding place tends to be here or in the body and less and less in the thinking mind. And then the thinking mind is seen more and more as a, as a contraction of the brain. It's a kind of muscle that just habitually picks up these emotions and, and, and things and just runs with it. And as your attention begins to be liberated from thinking, not so much of getting rid of thought, because that's a difficult one. Uh, I think in one of the talks just recently, I, I was mentioning that as a Samanera, the first kind of formal question I asked Ajahn Chah, this was at a, after a Pati Mok, I said, what can I do with all this thinking? How do I get rid of it? And he said, well, you, you know, thinking is natural. Thinking is natural. It's just a part of nature. I said, what? It's garbage. <laughs> it's not a rubbish. I can't take it. He said, no, no, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's an object. It's natural. So, so I said, well, wait a minute. And then I could see what he was pointing to is to be aware of thought as an object rather than be the, the poor guy that's trying to get rid of thought. It's another problem. So thought's difficult. But the difficulty often is because we take refuge in thinking, in analyzing, in judging, in idealism, and so on. So we're trying to kind of, you know, I think the labeling technique is very good, where you find that you, your mind is running with some strong uh, story, and you label it saying anxiety, or worry, or fantasy, or, or excitement, or inspiration, like inspiration, say. You get inspired, go on a retreat, get inspired. Wow, fantastic. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to sit four hours a day and I'm not going to have any more sugar and I'm going to be vegan and da 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 da. And that's going to, that's going to be great. That's still delusion. It's a me running with inspiration. Now, inspiration's fine, but if you run with inspiration, you, know, you run into a wall called disappointment. Right? But if you know inspiration, you know inspiration feels this way, it's a good energy, it's very positive, it's very uplifting, and this too will change. Then you're taking refuge in the unconditioned, rather than the condition called inspiration. Now inspiration is much nicer than disappointment, uh, and that's the problem. That's the problem. We seek the inspiration, and we can't bear witness patiently to the disappointment. So if you bear witness to the disappointment, you don't need inspiration. When it comes, thank you very much. Great, I'll go for it. But if you attach the disappointment huh, and you seek inspiration, you might get the inspiration eventually, but then you'll be afraid of the disappointment again. And you go through cycles of birth and death. Huh? See what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the, the witnessing or the awareness or knowing the way things are, is, is, is not an emotional attitude. It knows emotional attitudes. It's not a, a structure of self-thinking. It knows self-thinking. Huh? And, and so that could be the only, to me, the only gateway to the unconditioned and must partake of the unconditioned. What else could it be? It can't be a sight. It can't be a sound. 
It can't be a taste. It can't be a bodily feeling. It can't be a smell. It can't be a mental formation. And it certainly um, can't be society or uh, the governance of society or your parents. All of that is very conditioned, right? It, all of that can be good or bad. It doesn't matter. It's all conditioned. So what can be unconditioned must be something that is dependent on all of that. And that must be the knowing, the awareness, knowing the way things are. And trusting in that um, is also trusting in desirelessness. Because desire in, in, in tanha, in terms of, of, of um, uh, Buddhist teaching on Four Noble Truths, for us, what we're talking about desire is this movement outwards into objective experience, either pushing it away or trying to get something else. It's a movement towards or against, but it's not a staying home. Now, when you know unfulfilled desires, unfulfilled desire, and just know it as an object, without hurting yourself, you still eat and sleep and do have fun and so on, but, but you, you just know it, then you're no longer choosing to run and pursue and get some kind of objective experience. You're coming back home. Oh, unfulfilled desires feels this way. And that knowing is desirelessness. So once you put language like that in, into your practice, non-becoming, non-aversion, desirelessness, patience, these, these kind, that kind of language, it's always inclining you towards the island, towards peace. If, let's say, I think Patrick has suggested that one of the topics we could do for this session would be anger management, right? Um, great, go for it, manage your anger. <laughs> I'm all for it. But it would become problematic if you said to yourself, I have an anger problem. So we get to a kind of a contradiction or paradox, which I was talking about here at the monastery uh, last night, two nights ago. Um, I have with me uh, Anagarak uh, uh, Gabriel <laughs> and uh, Venerable Vipassi, right there behind the computer, you cannot see them. Anyway, I was, I was, I was kind of suggesting there's a kind of seeming contradiction or paradox that, it, that you, you might find. One is that I think in modern psychology they say um, you have to own your anger, right? So I suppose own your anger is when you're responsible for your anger. And if I'm angry at you and I think it's your fault I'm angry, I think that's what we're indicating. No, no, anger is the problem I have to deal with. And then Ajahn Sinedo says, don't take it personally. You know what? That's a contradiction. Huh? Is that a paradox? But it's not really. It's to take responsibility for your whole life, for your, your whole inner world, but then see it as objects arising and ceasing. Don't take it personally. So if I think that I have an anger problem or resentment problem, or a fear problem, and I'm someone who has this problem, I have to become someone else, we would say that's wrong view. I, I can't, but also, if I said, well, I don't have an anger problem, it's your problem, you make me angry. <laughs> that's also a wrong view, you idiot. <laughs> Whereas the middle way would be, anger feels this way, it has arisen. Is it skillful? Uh, is, it to be, is it to be pursued? Uh, Will it lead to the well-being of myself and others? Is it wholesome? What will be the results? That is, I suppose that's anger management, I don't know. But as soon as we say, I am someone who has an anger problem, or has a lust problem, or has a Netflix problem, or uh, I am too fat, and I'm too thin, and I do this, or I do that, that I sense is not mindfulness. But as soon as I say that, and I know it, oh, this is a sense of I arising, I come home again. So the middle way is not neither, you know, indulging, not taking responsibility for one's own actions and speech. That's one extreme. The other extreme is, is um, not um, I taking it personally and feeling guilty and so on and so forth. The middle way is to know it as Dharma. And that's what Satipatthana is about. You know that you know. You know, you know, the angry mind is the angry mind. The fear mind is the fear mind. You know, when a breath is short, you know, when breath is long, um, right? You know that you know, but it's the knowing. It's the knowing that's important. It's not the breath or that. We live in an objective world, so you have to do your thing. You have to drive a car, unless you don't have a car, then you don't have to drive a car. You to go shopping, nowadays you can't go shopping. Um, you have to pay for your mortgage and all that, but, I think we do that okay. 
I think we do that all right. I think we're pretty skilled at that, actually. The people I've met, they seem pretty together that way. But this other, this other um, perspective of the, the Buddha's enlightenment and what that means for the heart, the underlying peace that is, is consciousness, that, I think, is where we... I think we're all yearning for that or, or interested in that or have tasted that. And that's what I would, would hope to encourage in all of us is that an inquiry into that. To be good people, yeah. And to not, not uh, and to be responsible, be socially responsible, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all that, in, in, if that's all in place and one is only a social being, that, that can still be very unsatisfactory, right? So, so liberation has to be an individual thing, not selfish, but has to be individual by, by awakening and, and contemplating how profound that very awakening mind is. So that is kind of, yeah, I think that's something to consider. Um, maybe we could look at some questions, if anyone has any questions or comments. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, yes, we have had several people have sent questions to the, uh, the chat, to the chat line. Um, unfortunately, you know, due to the time limit, we can't answer, can't ask Ajahn Viridama to answer all, our, all of your questions. However, one thing I would suggest that I found in my own practice is, is that anytime I have a question, it often gets answered when Ajahn Viridama is answering another question. So we might not be able to get all, all your questions, but hopefully we can if you listen, we might actually end up answering your question to another question, if that makes sense. So, the first question that we have... Can you hear me okay? I'm good. Right. This morning, <clears throat> this morning you, you spoke about infinite patience and boundless compassion. Can you give suggestions on how one cultivates these practices in daily life? Right. So, what I was talking about earlier uh, was that you can put into consciousness suggestions which lead the mind. Or you can make demands, tyrannic, tyrannical inner demands, that you should be this and you should be that. So when we make the mistake of attaching to idealism, then we make tyrannical demands to ourselves that I should be patient and I should be compassionate, which is a tyranny. It's not patience and compassion, right? Uh, but we can do it another way. We can say, well, patience would be a really neat quality to move towards. And compassion would be a really wholesome uh, attitude to move towards. And it's not that I'm lacking it. I have some patience and I have some compassion. I'm not, not, I'm not a sociopath, right? <laughs> so I, I already know what that feels like. I already has a sense of that. So I, I, I think to myself, it'd be good to move the mind in that direction, right? Rather than the direction of, of being impatient and, and yelling at people and, and, and being cruel. So. I see that in my practice. I see that in my mind. It's okay. So why don't I just make that suggestion to myself? So maybe I, 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 I begin a meditation and I just settle the mind to presence. It's like this. And then I just put that language in infinite patience, boundless compassion. And I keep putting that into the mind as a, a suggestion. And the image I always use is a mirror that if I have a mirror, that mirror will show me what objects come to it, right? And if, if I have a perceptual mirror, let's say, a perception called patience, I bring that up, I make that strong as, a, as an idea, as a perception, as a possibility, then when impatience come, I see it better. I see it as, uh, I see it, oh yeah, yeah, that's not patience, that's impatience, oh yeah, yeah. And I become more patient with impatience, right? You don't have to practice patience when you're not impatient. <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> you have to practice patience with impatience. So if I'm an idealist, I attach to idealism, then I say, oh, I have to be more patient. I have to be more patient. Shut up, Mary. I have to be more patient or whatever. That's not patience. That's attachment to idealism. So I put up this language, infinite patience, boundless compassion. I do it a lot. 
my meditation uh, I'm in a queue uh, in a shopping mall or uh, I'm family members who are maybe arguing or whatever infinite patience balance compassion I just keep bringing it up bringing it up bringing it up and then it's not a kind of specific I guess it is a specific practice but it's a it's a perceptual uh, inclination I would say which helps me to see the other inclinations cruelty uh, judgmental or whatever and then that allows me to see them as objects as I see them as objects they have less power because I've encouraged patience infinite patience balanced compassion they become strengthened just by the nature of of uh, intention my intention is to to move towards those now idealism what it does it doesn't idealism doesn't recognize karma idealism says um i'm not i don't have any old baggage and i'm just going to be patient and compassionate right now forever which is rubbish it doesn't work that way the law that's like like um, telling a, a, an oak tree to be a beech tree it's not it's an oak tree that's what it is so realizing that we do have these karmic momentums which come into consciousness then what about transformation when does transformation take place it doesn't take place tomorrow it always takes place now because there is now so the now is impatience arises but i have brought into my infinite patience and i breathe with it or whatever i do right but now i've got this 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 training and this inclination and this challenge it's like a, like a craft isn't it? the craft of the heart i get this challenge oh here's the one i've been looking at that's the one i want to understand and i and i make that my project for two years about right it's not just a, like a little bit of inspiration oh, that was nice i'll do that for half a day you know it has to be like I, I think i did that particular kind of mantric suggestion for two years that's why i say two years now like if you just do it once and say oh that's a nice idea and then you get another i say the next week and next week there's no real practice it's just inspiration right it hasn't got really um the gravitas of a commitment and and an idea which works for you it has to be something that fits your heart and then yeah i want to do that i want to train it it's, it's like me with with furniture making uh i, I get a design i said that's going to be difficult i want to do that and then halfway through the i said if i ever want to do this again shoot me <laughs> and never mind that's a family joke um so so i take something difficult but not too difficult i take something difficult because i want to learn i want i want to grow in my craft so in the same of the craft of the heart i i, I realize that there's these character traits which overwhelm me all the time and i'd like to understand them more I'd like to move i like to use them actually to 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 move through them so it isn't a rejection or a, or a guilt or a blaming on the personal characteristics but it's just understanding them and say oh that's where the mind gets trapped into self-view that's where it falls into delusion and, and whatever it is that's exactly the place of enlightenment right there and then you if you take on that project you get better and better at it you fail you try you fail you try but you get better and better at it and the result is very very pleasing because you addressed essential stuff in your heart so, you know the essential stuff of your suffering but what else are you going to do right very, very very profitable in that way okay patrick thank you <clears throat> next question Ajahn, you suggested that we do our homework in studying the Dhamma th uh, theory as it is helpful with the practice. I am one who does not know a lot about the theory. Can you suggest where to begin this study? What did I give you the word of the Buddha? Yeah. I suggest a simple book called The Word of the Buddha, which um, comes from the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka. And Jnana Moli, was it? Jnana Tiloka, Jnana, Jnana, N Y N A T I L O K A, Jnana Tiloka, Word of the Buddha. And that's a, a very simple, it's what, 50 pages, something like that. And it is the Four Noble Truths, and it lists the Pali 
and the interpretations of the Pali. And it's something that Ajahn Sumedho, I think, went through 80 times in his first year. He just went over it and over it and over it. And, and, and that gives you the, the real uh, heart of Buddhist practice, which is Four Noble Truths. So rather than get like being encyclopedic, if you take something small like that and just like you'll find a word there and then maybe you'll cross-reference it with someone else, uh, but you really ponder that word. So like the, the three words on craving, uh, bhavatana vibhavatama kamatana, the craving to become, the craving to get rid of, and, 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 and sensual craving. And what does that all mean, right? What is good desire? What is bad desire? Um, uh, what, why does he use tanha? What's the, so, so getting your head around that particular word would take some work in your own mind. Right? So you'd read that, craving. Okay, the Buddha says the attachment to craving creates suffering. Yeah, but is it wrong to want to sleep <laughs> or to be comfortable? So you, 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 you're challenged, intellectually you're challenged. Why does he say that? Maybe you, you, you read something else around that. But what you're doing is you're internalizing it. Where, where is that in my mind? Where is that in consciousness? And again, then your direction of your attention is on something the Buddha suggests that would be very fruitful if you looked at that. Because if you looked at that, you get some insight which would help you liberate from suffering. So if you take that little book, and I think Abhante Gunaratana's books are very good. Um, uh, the, uh, the books are mindfulness, what are they called? Uh, eight Mindful Steps to... Do you remember, anyone remember? Anyway, Bhante Gunaratana, he has two books on the, we much these days, but, but that's very, very good. So someone maybe can chat on the chat line, tell you which one of those books it is. But something simple, right? And um, so if you, took, if you took the word of the Buddha from Yanati Loka, very small, um, very easy to, to go through, and then you'll get the basic structure and from that basic structure, you can ponder. And that, and that doesn't make, exclude other readings, but it does kind of concentrate your mind on, on that particular, um, on, on the Four Noble Truths, because that's what you want to learn. Now, um, then also you, 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 you'll find having got the, the basic structure of the Four Noble Truths, then you can listen very more profoundly, I would say, to Ajahn Sumedho's rendering of Four Noble Truths, or to Ajahn Jeff's rendering of Four Noble Truths, or mine, or anyone else's, Ayas, because then, then you've got, oh yeah, I see where they're coming from. But if you don't have that, then sometimes, like, I'll just talk about craving, maybe, and you won't know the context. This way I'll give you the context. So then you get a, a deeper, uh, hearing, I would say, of, 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 of dharma, uh, audio dharma, right? Because you, you're saying, oh yeah, that's, that's where they're coming from, that's what they're talking about. Huh? And then if you have um, like areas of, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the teaching which are, are uh, confusing for you, then uh, ask the teacher, ask, ask me or whoever you want and say, I don't, I don't get what that means. Can you direct me to a text which would help me with that? And that's very helpful because now your, 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 your readings aren't just like haphazard. I read this, I read that. You know, you're reading to answer a question. So the teacher would say, well, there's a really good uh, essay or book on that. If you go to that, read that. But you're pursuing your study not as an academic, but as a, as a uh, uh, as a practitioner, not that academics are not practitioners, but you're not, you're not just trying to accumulate information. So any way that you can ground yourself in the structures of the formal truths is, is very, very helpful, very, very fruitful, and then expand from that. Okay? Lynn, did you find that book? I saw you went out. She's got them there. But Patrick won't unmute her. <laughs> yeah, she's gonna she's gonna mute herself. No, we actually just received some some chats from people. Thank you very much, who have given us links. So, uh, okay, Tim, there you go. Yeah, Tim, maybe you can um, put the links to uh, the various books uh, on our website, please. All right, there we go. That's so fast. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All. Oops. Oh, Patrick's falling off. <laughs> 
this is why I try to leave my video off as much as possible. Okay, so what's the next question? There we go. Next question. Well, the, 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 it's actually a kind of a follow up to this. Um, where is it? Kind of a follow up in the sense of the opposite. Uh, Ajahn, I find I am very much inclined to listen to Dhamma talks than to meditate. Any suggestions? I don't understand the question. Oh, ah. well, this person is not meditating and, and more interested in, I think, in reading and listening. To say, say the question again, please. Sure. Give me a moment here. Um, I am, I find I am much more inclined to listen to Dharma talks than to meditate. So he's oh, I see. Okay, I got I'm you. guessing I on the intellectual you. side of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, listening to Dhamma talks is very entertaining, especially if you have a joker like me. <laughs> but, but actually looking at your mind, which is restless, is much more difficult, isn't it? All right, so um, Dhamma talks are inspiring or boring, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. But uh, meditation is is demanding. I would say it's demanding, and and it doesn't seem very productive. So, you know, you, you listen to some dharma, you feel inspired. Okay, I got some good ideas, and certainly that's helpful because certainly you will you will employ those ideas in daily life. I don't want to dismiss that. I you, you know, I love I love to hear my teachers, but um, I, I think in the modern age where you have so much access to audio dharma. Um, you wonder, well, how many inspiring talks can one listen to? And is it, is it a kind of um, simply an inspirational tone that the mind gets? Well, no, I think it's more than that. I think there are ideas which need to be repeated, and then you, you employ those ideas in daily life. So that's very, very good. So not to dismiss that. But the thing about uh, meditation is that it really heightens the capacity to know what you know, to know that you know, to know that you know, right? That's what you're trying to do, to heighten the capacity to be present and to be aware. Within situations which are not very attractive, like boredom or physical discomfort or, you know, things which don't necessarily, they, 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 like uh, an inspiring Dhamma talk or a beautiful piece of music or, 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 uh, the beauty of nature, they draw your attention and it's free. It's like you don't really have to put much effort there. But certainly a Dhamma talk you have to put some effort in, but the effort that you have to put forth to stay present to a mind which doesn't want to be there, which is experiencing discomfort or whatever, is a different kind of um, energy which you have to bring to it. And that energy then plays out in the day because it actually strengthens your capacity to know the way things are. Now, very often when, when things are neutral or, or not painful or not exciting, our minds just start to spin in thought. That's where they go, you know, fantasizing or some old memory or nothing bad, you know, nothing bad, but heedless. Da -da -da -da. So when you, when you stop and you sit down, the, the, the mind's doing that, but now you're actually witnessing it. Wow, there's a lot of thinking going on. Right? And that distancing, oh, that thought is happening, is, 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 is strengthening the awake mind. And then that awake mind is going to be more strengthened when you start to react to things. Now, teaching will also do that. Someone's talking about your reactivity and so on. But there's something about meditation which is very, very uh, fruitful in that way. Um, so Ajahn Chah was adamant about that with the monks. He said, if you want to meditate, meditate. If you don't want to meditate, meditate. If your meditation makes you peaceful, accept that. If your meditation doesn't make you peaceful, accept that. And you can, I, could, I could see what he was doing. He wasn't, you know, meditation isn't, isn't a pleasant experience. Sometimes, what, 10%? Okay, 11? <laughs> right? So if you, if, you, if you meditate with the idea, oh, this will be pleasant, well, you're going to be disappointed. Because it's not about pleasant, it's about awareness. Right? And that's why groups are good, aren't they? Or retreats. You know, any of you have done, say, a 10... Do I sound like a salesman for meditation? <laughs> Buy two. Um, 
<laughs> but but uh, like, like like all of us, all of you have done retreats. Say so you kind of you know you haven't been doing much meditation. You haven't had a daily practice. You go in the first three days of misery. <laughs> Your knees hurt. You're restless. You think, why am I here? I could be doing something useful. And, and, but you bear with it and, you, and you're with the group and the group supports you and you do the chanting and you hear the Dharma and your mind begins to settle. And then maybe day four, five, six, you have some clarity and some insight. And then at the day 10, you think you'll meditate for the rest of your life. And then you go back home and you forget again. <laughs> but well, what's happening on the retreat? You think about it. What's happening on the retreat is that the group is, is holding you. We're all holding each other, aren't we? and going through the kind of restlessness and boredom and negativity and, and not just reacting to that and going to some experience which is uh, uh, essentially pleasing, just staying with the unpleasant or the boring. You stay with it, you stay with it, but with mindfulness, and then the mindfulness begins to just, you know, your consciousness it's more and more becomes that embedded mindfulness and peace. Right? Not because you manipulated the experience to get what you want. No, not because of that, but because you just witnessed the experience just as it was. You stayed as witness. Huh? And that's difficult to do on your own. It's very, very difficult. I think it's, from what I've seen, it's a little difficult, to, other than breaking addiction, I suppose, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a difficult self-discipline people have, especially in the modern world where there's so many really interesting distractions, like furniture videos. <laughs> And things like that. So I would uh, I would encourage people to to try to get a daily life practice. I know everyone says that, and and get some kalyanamitta to do it together. That's very very helpful. And the best way to kind of get get a kickstart is to do a retreat. But nowadays, right, retreats are cancelled. So here we are doing a DOM. Okay, Patrick. Thank you. Next question. Ties in a little bit with what you're mentioning about the daily practice. Can you describe a daily practice with metta and compassion that would help during this particularly challenging time? All right. Um, well, you have to. You'd have to look at its opposite too. You have to look in your in your own mind. What is metta and what is its opposite? I would say, uh, and and its opposite would be like the opposite of metta. To me, would be some kind of alienation. It would be you are different than me, so it'd be judgment. Um, you're wrong, I'm right, or I'm pathetic and you're great. Whatever you want, it can be a, a, an elevation of me and a diminution of you, or an elevation of you and diminution of me. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> and uh, it could be that, right? But how does, how does the sense of separation, alienation, arise in consciousness in, in your own? So it might be political judgments. You know, you might, you might see a politician on television and, and um, feel you'd like to strangle him. Um, say, say, like, uh, the, the story I have when, when we were in, in Thailand uh, during the Nixon um, when he got thrown out, what do you call it when a person gets thrown out? Uh, uh, impeached. impeached, that's the word. Uh, when Nixon got impeached, we, we, I was in Thailand and we had no newspapers or American, I think it was from the Peace Corps, came along and he he started talking, he was all fired up with American politics, which people do. <laughs> and uh, so he, he when, when, when the discussion was, I was listening, when Pastor was talking with him, <coughs> and when the discussion kind of drifted to American politics, and whenever the word Nixon came up, you probably heard this story, but <coughs> you live it. And just go off on this kind of tangent of hatred and, <coughs> and then Lopez Sameda noticed that. Couldn't help but notice it. And so he started to play with him. 
So they'd be talking, blah, 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 and they'd say, Nixon. <laughs> and he did it about four or five times, Nixon. <laughs> and then after a while, he said, do you realize that you're a complete Pavlovian dog? And every time I ring, ring the Nixon bell, you go nuts. Where's your freedom? Where's your freedom in that? So maybe it'd be that, like, you know, maybe your auntie uh, triggers your stuff or, or, or whatever it is. So, so you start to see the patterns of alienation, I think. That is very, very important. And, and, and then um, when, you, when, you, when you bring up the perceptions of metta, their perceptions of metta is done in two ways. It's done in a dualistic way and in a transcendent way. The dualistic way is about me and you as individuals. So metta bhavana is, may I be well, may I be free from suffering, may you be well, may you be free from suffering. So it's usually translated as loving kindness, but loving kindness can be a pretty powerful word um, towards someone you really dislike and you can't do it. But I would say it's more not dwelling in, in um, ill will. So it's good will. So if you take it as good will, right, that even though you dislike someone, when your mind and their demise in kind of cruel ways, you say, no, that's ill will. You may still not like them, but not indulge in ill will. Now that we can do. If you say to me, uh, I have loving kindness for someone that has really offended me or hurt me or abused me, that's pretty hard. The word is too big, isn't it? Maybe for the Dalai Lama or someone like that, okay. But for your average suffering being like you and I, that word can be some, sometimes too big. But not dwelling in ill will, I mean, that's manageable because that's in thought. So, so as, I, as I start to have hateful feelings to someone, uh, I say, no, uh, I'm not going to go there. That's, that's metta bhavana. Now, why I mention Mr. Nixon is because I know American politics can be very, very um, energizing. <laughs> and people can justify their hatred of whoever because maybe the, the perception of the person is so very, very foolish. And it might be very foolish. So, um, but still what happens in the stream of consciousness is that what is strengthened is the real and hatred. So you think, well, it's, it's justifiable that I hate this person. One can dislike them, but to hate them means that the karmic momentum of your mind will be in, in encouraging hatred to some way and it will manifest somewhere else. So there's, there's, there's and everyone else say, yeah, yeah, you should, that, that person should be hated. Good, good idea. I hate them too. Right? So, so a whole culture might encourage hatred of something like, so then you could have something like a, a racial group or a president or, you know, whoever you want. Um, but what's happening, if you're looking at stream of consciousness, you don't want the mind to, to begin to habituate to hatred, which isn't, doesn't mean you, uh, uh, that you don't oppose uh, uh, evil forces or, or that you don't object to things you, you dislike, but you don't let your mind dwell in your will. That's the kind of basic um, idea of metta. And then if you can, you also go to goodwill. Right? May, may, may this being be free from suffering. And it might be very hard to do that to some people. You can, you can dwell in non will so, so then the classic way of actually considering that is to bring up language of self and other. Uh, may, may my mom be well, may my dad be well, may my brother be well, uh, may my neighbor be well. So you're actually bringing up perceptions of goodwill. And if you do that to someone very close to you, two or three people or five people, uh, and you bring up that perception, it becomes a very real perception because that's the way you feel towards them. So you do that every day, every morning, twice a day, before your meditation. Uh, may my mom be well, may my dad be well, may my pastor be well, may Gabriel be well. <laughs> and, 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 and because it's a real feeling, it's not abstract, you, you really, you really um, encourage that as a flow uh, as a tendency, as a flow, as an attitude in the stream of consciousness. And the more you do it, the more that tendency comes up. And the more that tendency makes you, makes you aware of ill will, right? So the enhancement of one uh, illuminates the arising of the other. 
So it has a double function. It, 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 it strengthens that tense towards goodwill. And, and, and goodwill is not egotistical. Right? It, it's not like you, you're not really creating a sense of ego around it. They're just, may all beings be well. Whereas ill will is very egotistical. I hate that person. They're a terrible person. Or I hate myself. Same thing. Hate, hate. Doesn't really matter. You can hate. You can hate a rabbit, you can hate yourself, still hate. Don't hate rabbits. I don't, do I say anyone hate rabbits? <laughs> Farmers. <laughs> so, so then you're, you're, you're cultivating this tendency, this perception of goodness. So that's the sort of dualistic way of looking at metta bhavana. So in stream of consciousness, you're encouraging uh, a perception of others to be free from suffering and, and not dwelling in ill will. And you're using patterns. So the way I teach is I, I usually bring my attention to the heart and then I, and I, and I raise into consciousness someone whose image and, 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 and memory, when I think of them, easily brings me to the heart. So I usually begin with Ajahn Sumedho and I bring up Bon Paul and right away I feel gratitude, I feel goodness and then I, and, and I'm on the out breath. So that's on the in breath and the out breath, Bon Paul, may you be well. Fabulous feeling. Fabulous, you know, very, 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 very nice. Uh, and then I'll do some others. I'll, I'll usually go through all the monastic community and really exercise that, I suppose. Huh? Let, that, let that feeling really become strong. I do that a lot. So that, that sets up the perceptions of self and other. And the other way of looking at metta bhavana is the, the way of transcendence. And there, we're not, we're, we're considering not the social definition of me and you, but we're looking at our experience as stream of consciousness, as sight, as sound, as smell, as taste, as bodily feeling, as mental image, as emotion. Just a stream of events coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. Both are true. There's both the sense of me and you as subjects in this game called life. But it's also true that awareness can know all of that as a movement coming and going, coming and going. And so there, metta bhavana is, is acceptance. And, and Lopo Sumedho has a phrase, uh, as I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, it all belongs, and no, it, uh, it's like this, and it all belongs. Now some people, when I say that to them, they think oh, what we're doing is condoning uh, cruelty and hatred and injustice. Well, if that's what the perception brings, then don't use that. Right? But what Lopo Sumedho is pointing to is that anything that arises is natural, even cruelty and stupidity. One doesn't condone it, but the sense of, yeah, that's life. Life contains that, but then in our social life, not dwelling in ill will. So this is, this is the idea of transcendence. Is you, you, you accept that into consciousness you might have a quite horrible thoughts and feelings, and it all belongs. And that's what metta bhavana is, not aversion to aversion, say or to fear. It's an open, accepting awareness of even the, the dark side of your mind or the horrible things. But you have enough strength in, in sila and, and, uh, and in your own uh, personhood in, in the world that you don't believe it. You know it, you know it as it is. And, and then as it comes to them, it's not a threat. So maybe like you feel jealousy towards someone. And, and you know, they, they are more successful than you, or whatever, and, or whatever you want, and you feel jealousy. And then um, you start to think you will, right? Uh, I hope they get a flat tire in their BMW or <laughs> whatever you want. And then, then you feel guilty about that. Oh, I shouldn't feel, I should have met them. I should have met them for them. May they be well, may they be well. But deep down, you hope they have a flat tire. And that, of course, is very really confusing because it comes from idealism. Whereas this transcendent way of looking at uh, our minds is, oh, even jealousy, that belongs. But you don't believe in it. It belongs. And that's metta. It's an acceptance of this strange thing about being human where we have the, the good and evil moving through us, but we no longer take a position with either one. We act on the good and the evil we no longer act on. But we are open and aware of the whole business and there's no repression. So that line it's like this and all belongs. It works for some, but I know for many it doesn't work because it sounds like one is condoning a cruelty or injustice, but that's not it. It's the transcendent nature of awareness and that awareness also is kindness or is compassion because it accepts all things. 
So that's the way I use the ideas of metta, um, both as a, a practice that I initiate in my meditation, and I use imagery, I use people, I use the heart chakra a lot, breathing in and breathing out, really becoming conscious here. Waking up in the morning is a very good time. Like when you wake up in the morning, when you're coming out of deep sleep, uh, and, 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 and before, before the ego mind is being um, activated, I suppose, uh, before thought is activated, if you have good body awareness, you quite often notice the heart's very open. Because I think a deep sleep, I don't, clinically, I don't know if this is true, but anyway, it seems to me that in deep sleep, the hearts can be very, very open. And, and then, so coming out of sleep, if you train yourself, before you go to sleep, train yourself to, when you awake and go to your heart, when you're awake and go to your heart, rather than just sort of half awaken and then go to, I don't know, I don't want to wake up. Oh, what is it? Eh, it's five o'clock. I don't know, blah, 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 right? That kind of semi-conscious awakening. Try to, try to wake up and, and say, where's the heart at now? What's the heart feel like now? And, and, and I find very profitable spending a lot of time with the physical heart and, and just being conscious of the feelings there, just doing that, getting out of the thinking mind, down to the here and saying, how is... How's the heart responding to this? I find that very informative and interesting. And then the, the deliberate practices of breathing in, Lo Paul, may you be well. Breathing out, Lo Paul, may you be well. Gabriel, breathing in, may you be well. Vipassi, breathing in, may you be well. Those very, very real uh, images actually are stimulating that because I have love and, 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 and consideration for these people. So those are two ways that, that, I, that I do that. Patrick. Uh, how are you feeling now then, Ajahn? I, you, Prost. I feel great. <laughs> shall we continue? Do you want to take a bit of a break? Or? I'm, I'm fine if you're fine. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that one. That was wonderful. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, here we go. Uh, is renunciation a practice that we should consider embracing regularly, for example, daily or weekly, especially in these times when, this, with, uh, when we have distractions with uh, screens and food? Screens and food, is that the refuge? <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> uh, that's understandable. Um, well, I would, you know, whoever <laughs> posed the question, I would ask, well, what is renunciation, right? And is it like shaving your head and, and never watching Netflix? <laughs> uh, or is it something more profound than that? Well, to me, the, the heart of renunciation would be to understand that in the conditioned, you cannot find the unconditioned. And well, how do we in Theravada describe the condition? We talk about it as the five khandhas, or sense experience, or, or stream of consciousness, or these conscious events, right? We'd say that's all conditioned. So renunciation is that you don't seek the unconditioned and the condition. So it comes from an understanding of where transcendence lies. It doesn't lie in sights, sounds, tastes, bodily feelings, smells, emotions, uh, personal relationships, or the television. It doesn't lie there. Huh? But that doesn't mean that those are bad. That doesn't mean that those are bad. They are just as they are. They, they excite the mind or they bore the mind, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, renunciation then is realizing the limits of sense experience, not rejecting them or negating them, just realizing, well, that's very limited. And it can be useful. So if you are, maybe if you're depressed and you play Pierre Gint or some kind of beautiful piece of music. I had a, I had a grade three teacher at Annette Public School. I went, I went to Annette Primary School in Toronto. Those of you from Toronto, which is near Humberside, which is my high school. Um, and that grade three teacher was a beautiful artist. And, and, and she played um, Grieg's Pierre Gint for us and, and taught, taught us the story of this, this beautiful Scandinavian piece of, piece of music. And, and ever since then, whenever I hear it, it just brings up these ethereal feelings of beauty and so on. So that's a sense experience, but it can be very uplifting. 
But you can see that if I always had to go to some sense experience to uplift myself, then I would become more and more restless because I wasn't addressing the, the, the you know, maybe the, the sadness in my heart or whatever. So again, I'm not, it's not so much a rejection, renunciation and rejection. It's like, okay, this lifetime is valuable. Now, what, what would be useful in this lifetime? Well, to listen to Greek. Okay, good. <laughs> That's fine. And maybe even have a pizza on the way. But is there something more profound? And as you see, there is something more profound. Then the tendency to look for peace in that which is not peaceful falls away. So then, you know, then it comes to, are you, are you, are you a person who seeks peace or understanding? Or are you just happy with a refined sense of pleasure? That's just fine. Okay, so if you're not of that type to seek peace, then fair enough, do your best. But when your hearing fails or whatever, then you're going to have a lot of disappointment. So that's why we talk about these things in Buddhism and say, yeah, okay, the music was great and, and so was the pizza. Um, but what happens when that falls apart? Now the sensualist says, well, then I might as well indulge more, right? Might as well listen to more music and listen to more Netflix and have a bigger pizza because soon I will die. <laughs> but the Buddha is saying, yeah, 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 we're all going to die, but there is something else. There is the uncondition, there is peace, there is the deathless. So Buddhism without the deathless would be like, would, like, like if you didn't have a transcendent alternative to sense experience, why not just indulge it till hell comes, you know, as you can, because that in itself is unsatisfactory. So even, even if you didn't have the idea of the deathless, you would see that craving becomes more and more and more, and craving becomes a, a, an addiction, and it's, it's a lot of suffering. But the Buddha didn't say just that. He didn't say that craving is just uh, an accumulation of restlessness. It's also this, this alternative. So renunciation isn't just like that you shouldn't do things. It's about looking for an alternative or, or noticing an alternative which is there. And you can't do that. You know, if you're looking in, in the right corner of the room and what you're actually looking for is in the left corner of the room, you have to stop looking in the right corner of the room, right? Or left, if <laughs> you got that. <laughs> and, and, and so then you're looking in the wrong place. You're looking for peace in that which is not peaceful. Oh, that's what renunciation means, I see. So then you see, say, like a, a monk's, monks are still of it. Um, so what's wrong with sex? Nothing's wrong with sex. It is as it is. It's natural. But if the mind uh, seeks distraction through sexuality, that's an object. Nothing wrong with that. So renunciation, uh, celibacy is quite difficult for young men and so on. And, and then, oh, wow, this is a strong energy. This is a strong object. Sexual desire is very, very strong. But if it's uh, witnessed, not in a repressive way, not because it's evil or wrong, it just is as it is, but it's a natural phenomena, and awareness is able to witness that as a natural phenomena, it doesn't attach to it, mindfulness is very, very powerful. Now, if you, if, you, if you say that sexuality is wrong or it's evil, then that's, a, that's another tradition. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it is as it is. So renunciation, say celibacy, um, a lot of people can't understand it. Why would you do that? That's a bit weird, isn't it? Are you repressed or what? Well, no. No, I mean, you could do it wrongly. You could do celibacy wrong, but you could do it rightly by thinking, oh, wow, sexual desire feels this way. Uh, attraction to a sexual object feels this way. And that would require tremendous mindfulness, tremendous awareness. So part of renunciation is that. But also part of renunciation is, is like simplification. When, when, imagine if all the monks were married. <laughs> we all have girlfriends down the street. Very complicated. <laughs> now we have, you know, we, we, are, we are the way we are. And it's very simple, right? A bit boring at times, sure, but it's very, very simple. So renunciation is also simplification. So you're simplifying your life from all the sensual distraction human beings have to, to something which calms the mind and, and, and composes the mind. So if you try to impose an idea of renunciation, then that won't be mindful. But if you say, okay, I get it, I'm too distracted. And my mind just gets so wound up with distractions that I, that I really uh, have, have difficulty meditating or whatever. You say, okay, I'll, I'll try to practice some, some kind of renunciation. 
then you, you create a kind of program for yourself. You say, well, I'm going to watch the internet two hours a day. And, and that for people now, there's a huge renunciation, isn't it? That's worse than celibacy <laughs> or whatever it is. Right? I, I'm sure if, if, if the internet went down, everyone would be on the streets with pitchforks and, and torches, right? We would fall apart as a society. And so, so you, 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 put a, you put a constraint on, on your use of media, right? Not because it's wrong, because you want to look at the mind which wants to go outwards, you see? So you put a constraint on it, say, okay, three hours. That's a lot. Three hours, you know, you sleep eight. And you only got, so that's a total of 11. You only got half a day left. <laughs> so you say, okay, three hours. And then after three hours, I won't, I won't uh, look at the internet, say. So then you, you kind of mark out your, your daily calendar. And then if, each time you do a half hour, you might, okay, there's a half hour gone, two and a half hours left. Now maybe you watch a two-hour movie, you're in trouble. <laughs> You've only got one hour left, right? But now what's happening is you're becoming aware of the need to go out into an object. Before you could just do it for six hours and you just say, oh, I feel a bit, oh, wow, a bit drunk with that. But now you're actually developing mindfulness, awareness around the need for external stimulation. And you're using that, oh, this is what desire for internet feels like. And then you wait, and say, well, that's a stupid idea, and then you, you open the internet again. But at least now you're more mindful. So the first day you try this, you say, three hours, okay, I can do that. It's easy. And of course you fail. <laughs> and then you say, well, that's a stupid idea, and, and you give up. Well, that's not renunciation, that's giving up. So they say, oh, okay, this is diff more difficult than I thought. Okay, uh, I'll do three and a half hours, I'll negotiate with myself, but I'll really, really try now. And so you try and you try and, and, and you almost do it for four hours, okay. But it doesn't really matter the three or four hours. And now you're very aware of the desire for distraction. And you become conscious, oh, desire for distraction feels this way. Oh. Now, if you start to take refuge and awareness around the desire for distraction, you really see what renunciation is about. You're giving something up for the sake of peace, coming to the peace of mind. If you do this out of just some kind of willful effort, I will not watch, I will not watch, you might do it. But, and it might be good, like if you, say, if you're addicted to alcohol and so on, you know, you really need heavy, strong, strong strategies. But you want to, this to be a mindful exercise in training the mind so you can do it. So it's interesting, right? Um, so renunciation comes from this, I think, right understanding. You understand why, why we would speak to that. Now, in, in, in the press, Sure, people are talking about, we, you know, maybe we watch too much internet and so on because we get so exhausted by it. But in, 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 in a Buddhist sense, I would say it's that movement uh, to transcendence rather than movement out to objects that is the real heart of renunciation. Okay. So say for me, <clears throat> becoming a monk, why did I become a monk? I said, well, I just had faith in the Buddha. I said, well, if the man said, this is the way to do it, let's go for it. And I had the opportunity to do that. And then I found that renunciation in the monastery was <clears throat> simply stuff was not available. Okay? Eight months a day, and there was just nothing available. So it was pretty easy in that sense. It was hard in, in terms of my habits, but it was, it was sort of a cultural, it was a cultural renunciation. In, in my own culture, with so much distraction, it's much more difficult because it's available, right? It's available there, so you have you have a more a more tempting a more tempting situation. So it requires a much more self-discipline uh, to do that. 